two, three, four, woo! Welcome to Me and the Geek. I'm me, Joel Sharpton. You can follow me at The Rogue's Life on Twitter. And every week on Me and the Geek, we bring you a different geeky conversation with a, a cool geek for a peek into their world, their passion and their expertise. Uh, we think that everybody's geeky about something here at Me and the Geek, and we want to help you find your geek. This week, though, it's a special episode because, uh, first of all, it's a bonus episode. We just started our regular episodes on Thursday, and here we are with something extra. And you're saying, Joel, what are you doing? You're throwing the formula format off already. What we're doing is we're bringing you more content. From time to time, we're going to bring you these bonus episodes. We're calling them mcu episodes. And if they're not for you, that's fine. Uh, let them show up in your feed, delete them, pass them on by. But we think for some of our listeners, they might be something fun as a little bonus. And uh, if you want more of them, let us know that too, and uh, we'll see what we can do about it in the future. Kyle Sweeney, though, he and I both spent some time watching Agent Carter, the recent uh, series from Marvel Studios on ABC that was a fill-in uh, in between the hiatus of the first and second half of the second season of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent Carter is, of course, a spinoff of the Captain America the First Avenger movie. Peggy Carter, the sort of sidekick for Captain America during that film, the love interest in a lot of ways, uh, now back in the States after World War II, after her time with the SSR there, and what is she going to do without Captain America and without a war to fight so that the or some of the male uh, patriarchal ideas and uh, attitudes are sort of put by the wayside just because of necessity as it was during the war. What's going to happen to her now? That's what this series was all about. If you haven't seen the show, in the first couple of minutes we give you our opinion on whether or not it's something that you ought to look into through uh, Netflix or iTunes or uh, DVD or Blu-ray sales eventually. If you have seen the show, then the rest of this episode is going to be a great discussion of our favorite moments and some of our takeaways from the series and what more Marvel might uh, do better or differently in the future. So without further ado, this is the very first bonus episode. It's an MCU episode of me and the geek. Uh, so for our first MCU episode, it is uh, none other than Austin based sketch and improv artist, Kyle Sweeney. Kyle, how are you doing, sir? Doing great. Ready to get my Marvel on. For somebody who hasn't watched it, we'll stay spoiler free for a couple of minutes here. Overall, what did you think of the series Agent Carter? I liked it. I liked that it was a chance to do something different, a chance to do something within that slightly post-World War II period, uh, and something with the Agent Peggy Carter character from Captain America, the first Avenger, to sort of get a chance to see something that feels a little bit more grounded and, and less fantastical. Um, and it was nice to see sort of the separate side of this sort of uh, retro spy thriller-ish uh, TV show. I am excited about the potential for the further filling in of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the comic books, we've got this long history of Marvel that goes all the way back to World War II. You do have lots of stories in the 50s and lots of stories in the 60s and lots of stories in the 70s and the 80s and onward. And in the MCU, effectively everything starts when Tony Stark says, I am Iron Man at the end of the first movie. And before that, the only thing that really happened was this one incident with Captain America, with the creation of this soldier, and of, oh, he had some adventures, and then he got lost in an iceberg, you know? And what this series showed us was that that's not true. There's lots of things in between, and I think it's well worth telling. I think this was a, a fitting introduction to that era. Haley Atwell is a wonderful uh, piece of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I hope they continue to use her in the future. So that's our spoiler-free stuff. Now, let's get into some specifics. Let's say, why don't we talk about our favorite things in the series, and we'll go back and forth. I definitely like any chance that we got sort of larger MCU bits peppered in. Uh, a lot of that in, in terms of, like, we got to see the Howling Commandos again. We saw Anton Vanko, of course, Howard Stark and Jarvis, uh, Howard Stark's butler. Uh, a lot of that interconnectivity there. We saw Black Widow School. We saw uh, Roxxon Oil. Again, these other sort of world-building elements. That was fun for me. Um, I think my number one favorite part of the series was more Dominic Cooper. I love his version of Howard Stark. 
Uh, it started as sort of a poor man's Robert Downey Jr. impersonation, I think, but he's grown it over time into something much more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think he really fills out a part of Tony's story that we're never going to actually see. And the Howard Stark that we were introduced to in Captain America, the first Avenger, was so different than the Howard Stark we met in Iron Man 2. And this, I think, was a good bridge to start showing the changes in Howard himself. So anyway, uh, Dominic Cooper, my favorite part of the series, I think, uh, other than, than Haley herself. Definitely. <laughs> the further exploration of Peggy Carter... <laughs> The chance to come back to this character who was in Captain America First Avenger was the female lead in that, a very independent, tough British woman soldier uh, who's pretty instrumental in helping to take down uh, the Red Skull and Hydra. To sort of get to catch up with her four or five years later and see her sort of continue being a badass within that and underneath the noses of her fellow agents as well as under Leviathan's nose as well. The, the ability to see her... And, and sort of continue her story, which you always knew there would probably be more to that, especially after seeing her in Captain America Winter Soldier for her bit where she's a 90-year-old woman. You're like, oh, gosh, I got, we got to connect to these two points. Uh, I'm going to say that my next favorite part was Angie, as our buddies from Welcome to Level 7 podcast call her Angie from Hydra. Uh, so far, we don't believe she actually is from Hydra, or I don't believe so. But here's why I want to mention her as one of my favorite parts of the show. Uh, first of all, and, I, and I'm forgetting the actress's name, but hopefully we'll have it linked to the show notes. She's wonderful. She's been in a bunch of other stuff. And she's sort of known for her physicality. And so when she was cast in this show, a lot of people assumed that sooner uh, rather than later, she was going to break out of the uh, unassuming shell and end up being uh, maybe the big bad or maybe a, uh, an unexpected ally for Peggy. Turns out neither one of those were really true. She was just a friend. She was just a girl next door, a great actress, in fact. And... I think that character is really interesting. If there ends up being a second season of Peggy Carter, uh, which we will talk about uh, later on, I hope that she's a part of it. And I hope we get to see her grow in the unknown history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I, I guess the thing that's less about the show and more about the way it was sort of structured is that we had last year with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it was a very irregular schedule for their season one. Sometimes it would be two or three weeks between one new episode being aired and it was like super irregular but now within Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. season two this mid-season break was a full we'll say eight weeks if not nine between part one of season two of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and part two which is about to kick off next week just having the sort of regular thing to stay tuned into I think was huge not only are we getting more MCU on on the TV we're getting it consistently from, you know, fall of uh, 2014 all the way to summer of uh, 2015. I can't speak highly enough about that sort of shift. So you got one sort of Marvel block now for the entire TV year, which I think is great. So the next thing that I'm going to mention is Leviathan. I like the introduction of another uh, bad guy group. You've got this long period of dormancy for Hydra. Hydra is supposedly beaten after World War II, and S.H.I.E.L.D., at least, didn't believe that Hydra was any threat at all until the reemergence of that group uh, during the events of, of uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier. So... In between there, who is it that S.H.I.E.L.D. is fighting? And it only makes sense that it would be a Russian organization. And, of course, this uh, Leviathan group was introduced into the comics fairly recently, but I think they introduced them into the MCU in a great way. And what it does now is it allows us, again, to have an ongoing bad guy with some of the threads of HYDRA, some of the tools of HYDRA, as we saw in the post-credit sequence of the final episode, some of the agents of HYDRA even, sort of enveloped into their machinations. I thought that was great. And I especially liked Dr. Ivchenko. I'm going to start calling him Dr. Faustus because he's obviously the originator of the, of the Faustus uh, method. And, and so I'm going to call him Dr. Faustus. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> he's, he was certainly reading that book. Yeah. I guess the, the tone and the feel of Agent Carter was another one that like really hit home with me. Not only are we doing a fun retro period piece, but we, we get the opportunity to do something that's, again, 
for TV, but it's a it's a more grounded, and that's very weird to say connecting it to this comic book <laughs> universe. But it's just kind of a spy show, more or less. We're not really dealing with superhumans and all the other stuff that sort of explodes in present day MCU. Uh, so the story is smaller scoped for TV, kind of like Shield, but it feels more appropriate. As where Agents of Shield, you, you know Thor is flying around in Iron Man and. Captain America's going out on S.H.I.E.L.D. missions and, and stuff like that. So the fact that you're not seeing that on TV is kind of a little bit more of a stretch. But now that we have uh, Agent Carter, she's kind of more or less the biggest thing going in 1946 uh, that, we, that we've been introduced to. Uh, maybe Submariner's out there. We don't know. Probably. Well, I, I, I kept wondering if we were going to be introduced to somebody like the Union Jack. For instance, they use that uh, name even at one point during the Howling Commandos episode. But, you know, w was that agent actually someone that was out there working and, and do they exist in the MCU? I'm still hopeful, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. I'm still hopeful that we'll get a second season where we might flash forward a little bit and get into the late 50s, into the 60s. And I'm betting, based on the hints that we've heard about Ant-Man coming this summer, that there's a really rocking period of the MCU that we just don't know about because it was all done as super spy stuff and yeah. the public at large doesn't know. But I think there were a lot of superheroes working in that period. Yeah, I mean, again, maybe they're not Iron Man's. Right. You, you, you definitely probably have a, an era where Hank Pym, he hangs up the, the helmet at some point. So to see that and to see they've already got an Ant-Man, a set of comics that are leading you into... Uh, the Ant-Man movie, and I haven't got a chance to check those out yet, but the Peggy Carter character is drawn and depicted uh, in that uh, in that series of comics, so I'm interested to check that out as well. Um, all right, so the, my final awesome thing is the sort of the wraparound that you found, I think, in that I don't believe it was in the first episode, I believe it was in the second episode, and then you saw it again at the end with the Captain America radio show. I thought, first of all, it's a great um, sort of nod in the direction of the hokey jingoistic comics that existed in the original incarnation of Captain America. The other thing that it does is it's a showcase for Ralph Garman, who is yeah. a big hero of mine. He's a great voice talent. He's a great podcaster. He's a great comedian and, and uh, radio broadcaster too. So I, I was glad to see him with something to do. I liked that it sort of irked Peggy because of the depiction of Captain America's sweetheart in it. And then there were a couple of great scenes using it, sort of overlaying it. And in particular, in the finale, it was great to remind people of the whole Captain America storyline, which would then be brought up uh -huh. in the final moments. Yeah, I agree. I, I liked that as sort of a something that would connect you to Captain America, the first Avenger, but do it in such a way that it was obviously new. New and very distorted. He's speaking kind of on that, like there's the one of the things that I felt like that the show I felt that it didn't handle as well as I would have liked was the the ghost of Captain America. I mean, obviously, Steve Rogers is the love of Peggy Carter's life, even though we don't really get to see it completely played out in the first Avenger. A lot of that happens in montage and time dashes and um, them giving knowing looks to each other, but uh, sharing one kiss before Captain America goes to uh, fight the Red Skull on his flying ship. And uh, to never be seen again, as far as Peggy Carter knows at the time. But it felt like they kept almost too much throwing Captain America back into it. And like, well, it, she's important because of Captain America. When the show's main thesis is about how great she is individually, it's, uh, surely she'd be affected by losing Steve Rogers. But I felt like they just leaned on it too much. And the importance of that, it felt more like, here's another way for us to kind of shoehorn that connectivity to Captain America the First Avenger as well as the Marvel Universe in general. Uh, I wish they would have eased up just a little bit on that. Um, I can understand that. Uh, it wasn't my favorite part of the series. It didn't bother me, I don't think, as much as it did you, but, but I can definitely understand that criticism. Do you feel that there's any of that, like, oh, we have to have a female superhero. Well, who do we have on contract? Well, we've got this lady. She's delightful. And she's cheap. You know, like... I think there's some of that. Peggy Carter sort of broke out a little bit more than, I mean, she wasn't a damsel in distress in Captain America, the first Avenger, but once you got to the one shot, I think there was a fervor for like, oh, 
some people thought this was great, and now a lot of people think this is great. <laughs> so let's do this. And she's British, but she's also a rough and tumble gal who likes to punch, kick, and do all that other stuff. So I think that was something people hadn't seen, and, and to get a chance to explore it now, great. I think, I think my biggest knock against it would be that it didn't go far enough. Um, and part of this comes down to, as you mentioned earlier, they were sort of hemmed in by the one shot that already existed. Well, the problem is that once you make them, the understanding from the audience, at least, is that it's going to be canon, that it's actually part of the storyline of the broader movies and, ever, and the TV shows and everything that you're doing. When you try to put this series into place within the one shot, the only way that it even begins to make sense, really, is if the most of the one shot takes place before the series and the last couple of scenes takes place after the series, but none of the events of the one shot seem to, to make sense when surrounded by the series. And I think that is a bit of a slip up. I think there was a way you could have had your cake and ate it too, so to speak. Um, it would have taken Bradley Whitford for one thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You wouldn't have to have him for the whole series. I could understand if he wasn't available and so you couldn't make you couldn't replace Chief Dooley with him, for instance. But at the same time, you could have simply brought him in at the end as the new chief to replace Dooley. And then all over again, she's got to prove herself to this new uh, boss. The other thing that they did was, and again, the guys over at Welcome to Level 7 called him out on this. In the very first episode, there's a montage of action from Peggy Carter. And it's all supposed to be from the film's but it wasn't. There were two separate scenes that were taken from the one shot, which again would have to take place after this series. And, and it just those sorts of continuity things, it, it ticked me off. That's, that's the big knock against the series that I'll mention. I'll, I'll, I'll make up for it for a little bit. Logistically, Captain America, the first Avenger, didn't have Peggy Carter being a badass. She, she shot a gun and she shot a gun accurately. And that was about as much as her action scenes kind of went. So the one shot gave us the opportunity to see her take on eight or so different individuals in that warehouse doing kicks, doing stunt choreography and stuff like that. And I think that's that was important for them to set up that Peggy Carter's not just a woman in that opening sort of set of montage clips to sort of set that up for the expectation throughout the show that when she starts doing her not quite Black Widow ninja skills, but her her uh, SSR defense training that's been set up in some way. Well, and I will say that that fight in particular, those couple of fights, uh, the interactions between Dottie, the proto Black Widow, and Agent Carter, those actually did live up, up to expectations. They were very well choreographed, uh, as was the the big fight scene in the, was it a diner or a laundromat where the, all of the agents confront Peggy? She's there for coffee, right? right. It's, the, it's the diner where... Angie works, but obviously everybody's sort of being cleared out, and then, yeah, they have to sort of fight through all that stuff. Those scenes were both wonderfully choreographed, and I like that they were able to give Agent Carter a very effective and impressive fighting style without just mimicking the Black Widow style, because when you saw them fight each other, it was obviously two very different frames of martial art, and I, I appreciate that. Definitely, definitely. And it, it felt realistic, too, that uh, Peggy Carter wouldn't, she wouldn't be able to do super flips, but she can definitely climb and scale and kick and punch with the best of uh, her men compatriots. But she can do it in heels and a skirt sometimes. Well, and a, and a lot of that comes down to, again, the whole really point of the, of the series is that her male counterparts underestimate her. None of them expected her to be a danger, and therefore she was able to take them all down in one fell swoop. That's true. Hey, I got one more big beef that I, I've been sort of holding on to that I got. Okay. Up. I got to dump on this show. <laughs> okay. Ultimately, uh, we have this big conspiracy uh, involving Leviathan. And uh, at the end of the show, it just feels very small, incomplete. We've only seen maybe four, actually, I guess three individuals only that are part of Leviathan. That being one of the no voice box guys, Dottie, the proto Black Widow, and then our Dr. Faustus. And Dr. Faustus, his. His motivation, in the end at least, turned out to be just the revenge on Howard Stark for the death of his brother and lots of soldiers. It, it made Leviathan feel super small. I get that it was potentially still larger Leviathan stuff happening. And ultimately, this eight episodes 
concludes with, we got them, and we only know of three definitive people that are part of this, this terrible, mysterious uh, Russian-based spy slash terrorist group and that just felt like the biggest sort of misstep i i think i think that's part of the reason though because w- what it does is it puts the pieces in place so that agent carter and howard in particular understand the threats that they are now facing are something that they aren't currently equipped to deal with and so we'll have to build shield you know i mean like that's the next step and the question is do we get to see it uh, I don't know. This this was eight episodes long, and I liked that they sort of kept themselves to that uh, eight episodes versus a 23-episode season of this arc with a lot of filler episodes and stuff like that. But I'd argue that it could have even been done in maybe six episodes to to tell this story with Leviathan and Howard Stark's inventions going missing. That it would have been a, a nice nice to keep that even more compressed. Although I'm happy we did get the eight episodes. Yeah, I th- I think you could have shaved the time down, but I think you would have lost some of the character moments, which I think is the thing that Marvel TV is showing us that they have as an advantage over Marvel movies. The fact of the matter is we only have, you know, two and a half or if rumors are true, two hours and 45 minutes with the Avengers to spend. But we can spend, you know, 26 over the course of a year or 24 or whatever it is with Agent Coulson. We can spend eight hours with Agent Carter. And I I sort of like that. So whether it's Agent Carter or whether it's something else, I hope that Marvel brings back this mid-season series next year. I think Agent Carter is the obvious thing to continue. And, you know, it would be different if they had a killer idea to replace it on the schedule. But I don't think ABC does have that many killer ideas. No, and again, you're dealing in these sort of period zones, uh, again, 1946 for this. If they want to do a little time dash to the early 50s and sort of see some other development stuff happening, I think that could be great. But ultimately, whatever they do next, especially if they do something with Agent Carter, they, it has to be different. I think the sexism stuff has been played out a little bit. You can't really repeat yourselves there. You have most of the team's respect now, even if it's only partial credit to the bigwigs. And I guess even at the end of the last episode, everybody's like claiming that, oh, she'll be back. She'll be back. But she doesn't currently seem to be working for the SSR at the moment. Uh, yeah, not not when the series ends. Right. So I guess my final question to you before we wrap up, Kyle, is if, if uh, Kevin calls you up tomorrow, Kevin Feige, that is, the head of Marvel Studios, and says, Kyle, you're in charge of season two of Agent Carter what does it look like? I think you got to start peppering in the Hydra behind the scenes business. Again, all that's working towards what happens in Captain America Winter Soldier. Seeing little things like that start to happen. I really want to see a bit more of Agent Sousa. Uh, maybe Stark can give him a, whatever a 50s era robot leg would look like. To have little moments where you get to sort of pick things up and do something a little bit bigger without going crazy. Maybe you have a, a six-year-old Hank Pym show up. Although I guess the movie would have come out already, so uh, missed opportunity. I want them to go crazy. I want them to jump off the deep end into superhero world, and I want eight episodes next season of Agent Carter putting together uh, the original Avengers initiative. And I think that this happened in the 60s, and I think that Hank Pym was a part of it. And I don't think that you have to age Haley Atwell up that terribly. You know, she can look at, you can put a little gray in her hair. She can be a, a dapper, uh, you know, late 50s. You get the opportunity to give her a little bit of the old infinity formula so she doesn't have to wear that makeup for too long. But then ultimately it gets extracted at some point, And that's why when she's 90, she's still alive, but she looks terrible. <laughs> right. But, you know, like, I, there's no reason why we can't see some of these characters. And the fact of the matter is we're never going to – Marvel Studios is not going to make a movie about the 60s Avengers. Eight episodes, uh, fine. Maybe four or five different time-dashed seasons. I'll, I'll tune in. Uh, that would be interesting if they, like, if next year they did maybe two separate groups of four episodes. Like, so they did a 50s and, and with four episodes, and they did a 60s story with four episodes, too. Do we know yet who's playing young Michael Douglas in the flashback scenes in the Ant-Man movie? At one point, it was Patrick Wilson when Edgar Wright was still on the project, but then I think he ended up leaving when they bumped the timetable because he just couldn't fit it into a schedule at that point. 
Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm fully anticipating that we'll get at least at least one solid sort of scene of young Hank Pym and all of his uh, piss and vinegar sitting there in the, the 60s or mid-50s or whatever sort of makes sense. We might even be seeing the MCU version of the original Wasp. Right. My speculation is that she dies and that's part of why he stopped playing superhero. I I agree wholeheartedly, and, and, and we'll have a lot of that speculation, I'm sure, when we get uh, to Ant-Man this summer. So there's uh, my thoughts on uh, Agent Carter, the series this year, and what it could become in the future, and uh, Kyle Sweeney uh, chipping in his. And that's our first episode, or I should say our first mcu episode of Me and the Geek. Expect many more, because there's no shortage of this Marvel stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, and the secret here is that Kyle Sweeney is a man desperate for an MCU podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm smelling spinoff, buddy. That's, that's all I have to say. All right, man. Well, hey, look, uh, if you like these MCU episodes, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Give us some feedback. You can write us at me and the geek at team procreate.com and let us know if you'd like to hear more we're probably going to send you more whether you want to or not if you don't enjoy them feel free to download and then delete it's just that simple we appreciate your statistic anyway all right man kyle tell everybody where they can find more from you online check me out at kyle is funny uh, on twitter or kyle is funny.com for a highly unupdated website <laughs> And I perform Friday nights, 7 p.m. at Cold Town Theater here in Austin, Texas, uh, with a, a group called Movie Riot. And we are uh, the best thing since sliced bread. I'll modestly say that much. I think that's uh, an understatement, uh, if ever there was one. All right, Kyle, appreciate you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. The first MCU episode of Me and the Geek. We're going to try to have some more of these, especially after Daredevil is released on Netflix. Uh, soon I'm going to talk to Kyle again once we both had a, t- a chance to go through that series, and we'll do sort of the same thing. A couple of minutes where we talk spoiler-free and give you our opinion on the show overall, and then we go to, into uh, some specifics, our favorite and least favorite moments from Uh, the first season of Daredevil on Netflix. Hope you enjoyed that. If you did, feedback to us. Email us, meandthegeek at teamprocreate.com, or just let us know on Twitter or Facebook, Me and the Geek, in both those places. Search for us, like us, follow us, whatever you want to do, and uh, let us know what you think about the MCU episodes here at Me and the Geek. Next week, we've got a great episode for uh, for you. We're going to be talking to Brant Cooley about nerdcore music. He's known as Professor Shy Guy, and he's got some great albums uh, under his own name and with some bands that he's been involved with over the years. He's going to be performing at PAX East in just about a week or so, and we're going to talk to him next Thursday right here on Me and the Geek. Until then, this week's geek was Kyle Sweeney uh, on this special MCU episode. I'm me. You can find me at The Rogue's Life on Twitter, and this has been the podcast. One, two, three, four, woo! Me and the Geek is a proud member of the Procast Network, a Procreate production. Procreate is a community of artists in film, music, the digital arts, and fine arts that helps them connect and collaborate on projects. You can find out more at teamprocreate.com. Also be sure to check out one of our other great shows like Pod on Pod, a weekly review of a different podcast to help you find your new favorite show. Josh and Joel are your hosts as they walk through the wide world of podcasting. From comedy to self-help, Josh and Joel listen to it all so you don't have to.